Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. This is a nerve stimulator, a device that passes a small amount of electrical current at the tip of the needle during a nerve block performance and can detect a needle nerve contact even if you miss it on ultrasound. And today I'm going to discuss an important topic with you, why we should use nerve stimulation when performing ultrasound guided nerve blocks. Let's dive right into it. I know what you're thinking, the denizens of the high towers of societies and regional anesthesia journals might strongly contest this, quoting a lack of evidence. However, I urge you to consider a more comprehensive viewpoint. Discounting the value of nerve stimulation is a narrow-minded approach and carries the risk of patient harm and negative perception of the safety of nerve blocks, and it leaves practitioners exposed to the risk of medical legal scrutiny. And this is because the practice of nerve blocks using ultrasound alone is not objective, but subjective. And if you watch this video to the end, you may improve patient safety and your own confidence in practicing nerve blocks by implementing additional objective monitoring such as nerve stimulation and injection pressure monitoring. Performing nerve blocks using only ultrasound is subjective and dependent on operator interpretation image quality and numerous other factors, it is akin to flying an airplane using only visual clues. In fact, the available data demonstrates that even experts may miss an intranarrow injection in almost 20% of the nerve blocks by using ultrasound as a sole monitoring tool. Adding distance and collision alarms to cars and airplanes dramatically enhances the safety for the drivers, pilots and passengers alike. This is precisely what the nerve stimulators do when used with ultrasound. They can detect dangerous needle nerve position and needle nerve contact before the needle enters the nerve and causes the potential harm. Think about how the auto industry uses distance control sensors. These sensors provide a safety net, just as nerve stimulators can alert anesthesiologists to proximity to a nerve that might be missed on ultrasound. And although there was no evidence that car sensors would prevent accidents, adding an objective monitor of the distance in cars simply made sense. But the resistance to incorporating nerve stimulation as a standard and the lack of the consensus of what constitutes standards in regional anesthesia are hurting the further development of the specialty. While the regional anesthesia experts argue on their panels that there's no evidence that nerve stimulators add any additional value, they completely ignore the fact that just like not everyday car user is a professional driver, there are anesthesiology professionals who need to use nerve blocks but could use additional instruments for safety, such as a distance alarm. Let's take a historical example. In 1986, pulse oximetry was added by Eichhorn based on his paper in the Journal of Anesthesiology as a monitoring tool in anesthesiology and in 1989 already became the ASS standard monitor during the administration of anesthesia. Although the evidence still does not exist that pulse oximetry improves patient safety. However, it simply makes sense to monitor blood oxygen saturation objectively instead of relying on the color of the patient's skin or the color of the blood in the surgical field to judge the oxygenation. Moreover, the use of pulse oximetry allows medical professionals to objectively communicate about patient's condition. Instead of describing the patient's condition as she was pink throughout the operation, using pulse oximetry, the medical professionals can trend the oxygenation patterns and express it objectively, say, stating that her O2 saturation has never been lower than 95% throughout the case. You see, the introduction of ASS standard monitors, such as pulse oximetry and tidal CO2 monitoring, monitoring of the heart rate and blood pressure, has replaced the subjective monitoring before 1986, which consisted of palpating the pulse, watching the chest raise, and judging the patient color. As a result, instead of stating that the patient was pink, that the pulse was good, 
and her chest was rising, we can objectively communicate and document the physiologic data by stating that the heart rate ranged between 70 to 80 beats per minute, that the oxygen saturation was between 95 and 98 percent, and that entire CO2 was between 35 to 40 millimeters throughout the case. This objective monitoring allows medical professionals to adjust patient management based on the objective data and it helps them being protected from the medical legal claims. In other words, if the monitors indicated physiological values throughout the case, the practitioners cannot be accused of being negligent even if the complications such as a stroke or a heart attack occur. These complications can occur at random without a human error. Similar to this, nerve stimulation can provide objective data when performing nerve blocks. This data not only aids in patient safety, but also offers protection against potential medical legal issues. Here's how that works. The nerve stimulator passes a small amount of electrical current every second, and you set the nerve stimulator to 0.5 milliamps, and let's say two hertz, meaning every second you get two of these pulses of 0.5 milliamps that pass on the tip of the needle. As that happens, if your needle happens to encounter the nerve, this will be the needle and this will be the nerve, and there's a motor response that occurs before you see the ultrasound, what that really means is it gives you an opportunity to understand that the needle is very close to the nerve or on the nerve, and it gives you an opportunity to stop advancing the needle before the needle contacts or enters or damages the nerve. In other words, if during the needle advancement on the ultrasound you visually miss the needle nerve contact, an unexpected appearance of a distal motor response to nerve stimulation will alert you that your needle is already close to the nerve, on the nerve, or even intraneural, and this gives you an opportunity to refocus on the ultrasound image to see what you have missed. Now, neurologic complication during peripheral nerve blocks can still occur, even if you've done everything right. But if you use nerve stimulation and documented a lack of motor response, it demonstrates that you took all possible precautions to avoid nerve injury. Now, this is totally different from giving a deposition trying to defend yourself and saying that the plaintiff's team should trust you that you saw the nerve on ultrasound and you injected outside the nerve because it is difficult, if not impossible, to document and store in the medical record ultrasound data or ultrasound movies. The nerve stimulation, however, is objective, a binary data. You either had a motor response to nerve stimulation or you did not have a motor response to nerve stimulation. This is very powerful and definitive in your defense and patient's benefits. Couple this with objective injection pressure monitoring during injection of nerve blocks and it becomes clear that you've done your utmost to ensure patient safety, giving you confidence in the face of any potential legal challenges. In an upcoming video, I will delve into the subject of injection pressure monitoring, an underutilized but incredibly important monitoring concept. But for now, let me conclude by saying this. Implementing objective measures like nerve stimulation and injection pressure monitoring won't completely eliminate the risk of neurologic complications, but it does assure you and your patient that you've done everything in your power to mitigate their risk. Documenting the presence or absence of motor response during nerve block performance is a very powerful objective statement because as opposed to ultrasound, which is visual and subjective, Nerve stimulation is either present or absent, and if it is absent, while it does not comprise 100% protection, it strongly indicates that the needle nerve contact or intraneural needle placement was unlikely. Moreover, it indicates that you as a practitioner have done your best to prevent needle nerve and injection injury during peripheral nerve block. Thanks for tuning in today and don't forget to like, subscribe and turn on the notifications so you don't miss our next video. Take care everyone, until next time.